I'd like to welcome everybody to the first March meeting of the IMAG MSM Working Group on Multiscale Modeling and Viral Pandemics. We have a single talk today, by Alexander Hoffman from UCLA. As always, I need to remind you that the meetings are live streamed on YouTube and those live streams are recorded and archived for future viewing. As always, Reinhardt and I are happy to have your suggestions, comments, critiques, suggestions. Jim Sluka continues as our web administrator and also a strategist. And Lorenzo Vischini has been deftly handling scheduling and coordination. We appreciate that very much. Please help us use our communication channels. If anybody needs reminders of what they are or needs access to them, please come to us. I particularly want to remind you that we have a great archive of talks, uh, more than 100 talks now, and uh, please help us distribute those and make sure that they get the viewership that they deserve. Easier thing to remember is the Twitter feed, uh, MSM Viral. Uh, we announce meetings there, and if you have news items that you think should be put up there, please let us know. Uh, maybe we can use that to help build the community a bit more. There are a couple of exciting uh, public press releases that have come out recently. Uh, there's an article in the Omaha World Herald on Tom Helicar's work on digital twins. Uh, they also asked Reinhardt and myself for comments. It's a great article on the future of this project, and we strongly recommend that people take a look at that. And there was also a very nice article on uh, Reinhardt's work on medical digital twins that uh, is worth having a look. Uh, we'll share the links in the chat for people as we go forward. If you have any news items, press releases in your universities or press in the wider world that you would like us to let people know about, we're happy to do that. We'll post them on the IMAG wiki and we will also share them through our communication channels. We have a Facebook uh, channel. There is a LinkedIn channel. Uh, we have the uh, IMAG MSM uh, Working Group YouTube channel. Uh, so these are all available to you. And there's also a preprint uh, from Gary and Chase, preparing for the next COVID using AI to discover multimodal immune modulators. And so that may be of interest to many people in the room as well. So please uh, do help us keep people up to date on what's going on and use us to promote what you want to do. Uh, Reinhardt has an announcement and I'll turn that over to him. Uh, thank you, James. I want to um, let everybody know that we have uh, three faculty positions available. These are uh, tenured positions <clears throat> at the um, full and associate professor um, level, one each, and one uh, tenure track assistant professor position. They're in the uh, Department of Medicine, so you would be in in close um, proximity with uh, clinicians and experimentalists uh, in a, a setting that's uh, very um, <clears throat> interested in collaboration. If you have any interest or if you know somebody who does, please uh, pass this on. And uh, anybody who wants to know more details, let me know. Uh, tomorrow, um, Lorenzo will send out the weekly mailing and uh, the full text for the um, for this announcement will be included. So, uh, so thank you, James. Again, people should feel free to send us suggestions or speak up. Uh, I'm always saying I'm looking for a postdoc in multi-scale modeling. So if you have anyone, let me know. Uh, that remains true, uh, but please help us uh, build the community that way as well. Are there any other announcements before we continue? I guess I forgot to mention that this is the University of Florida. Not everybody, not everybody knows that that I'm here. So it's the Department of Medicine, University of Florida. Thank you. 
And we have our working uh, group subgroup tomorrow, right? Yes, correct. So the, that's digital twins tomorrow? No, no, I'm sorry. Tomorrow is the it's steering my group. My steering group. My so, mistake. So we have steering group fun. committee meeting tomorrow morning at 11. If you think you should be there and you haven't been invited, let us know. And we'll make sure to add you to the invite list. Any other announcements before we go forward? No? Well, coming up uh, next week, we have Benjamin Tenover uh, from NYU speaking of on SARS mediated systemic inflammation. We have a single talk scheduled so far. Uh, on March 17th, we have Sally Sieberts and Julia Arciero scheduled to speak. March 24th, uh, Susan Schreiner. If you would like to speak uh, March 10th onward, please let us know. If you would like your postdocs or students to speak, please let us know. And if there are people you would like to hear, Lorenzo is incredibly good at getting people to say yes to invitations. So don't be afraid of saying that you really would like to hear the latest experimental, clinical, uh, or computational work, we'll do our best to get them on the schedule for you. So please do let us know what you would like to hear and help us fill our schedule. Please remember to mute during the presentation. We only have one presentation today, so we'll have a presentation followed directly by discussion till four. And I don't want to take any more time from our speaker. We're very pleased to have Alexander Hoffman today from UCLA talking about the modeling of, the, of innate immune signaling, which is a topic that has come up repeatedly during the meetings we've been having, and I think is, is highly timely. So I won't take any more of your time. I'll turn the share over to you. All right, well, thank you so much for um, inviting me to share some of our research and um, some of our modeling work and systems biology work. Let me see what I can share here, yeah. And then I will, can you see the screen? Works, okay, great. Um, let's see, there's something here. Maybe I can remove. Okay, um, I'm really pleased to tell you a little bit about our um, modeling work of innate immune signaling. I actually I uh, will probably restrict myself today to NF-kappa-B signaling. Um, we are also working on some uh, on the interferon pathway, and uh, there's some new work that hopefully will come to fruition soon. Um, but I didn't want to uh, occupy the, both slots here today, so um, I might go a little bit over um, one, but um, uh, but uh, hopefully not uh, the entire time. Okay, so uh, my background of, is, uh, is that I was, uh, I, as a bachelor student, I was uh, in math and physics, and, um, but at some point during my bachelor degree discovered biology and then went uh, to, uh, to the Rockefeller University as a PhD student in biochemistry and pipette it for 10 years. Uh, until I discovered that maybe I can actually blend the two together by, at that point, most of the work being done by my trainees, of course. Um, and, and so the work that I'm going to describe today has, uh, it has experimental foundation in, of experimental data that is generated in my own laboratory. And so um, I, the work that we, that I describe, I think is, sits more closely in this field of systems biology, less mathematical than many of you are used to. Uh, but I think some of the work has drawn in mathematicians, some, some of whom we collaborate with and others 
have taken our models for a more rigorous analysis. So please bear with me as I describe um, some of the background first on uh, innate immune signaling. And I start with introducing that immune responses are initiated by cells that we might call immune sentinel cells. They're macrophages, dendritic cells, maybe even fibroblasts. And their job really is to survey the, uh, surveil the, um, the environment and are able to respond to a whole range of different um, uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns uh, that are uh, found in viruses, bacteria, or eukaryotic pathogens, and of course also tissue damage. So molecules that are released by dying cells uh, can initiate uh, immune responses to, uh, to um, repair. And those cells uh, are in response to these very diverse types of insults are able to uh, respond in a variety of different ways. First of all, cell intrinsic defenses, so actually gobbling up the pathogen and killing it. it might, they might also uh, initiate the recruitment of other cells to the site of infection, and thereby by producing cytokines and chemokines that attract other immune cells to help with uh, neutralize the immune threat. And they also secrete cytokines and other aspects that uh, activate the systemic immunity, you know, including the adaptive immunity of B and T cells. So all of this is done by these immune sentinel cells. And so there are literally hundreds of genes that are participating in this. And then, and there are many signaling pathways that play a role in this. And when these things are not regulated properly, um, there's lots of pathology and disease that can be traced back to misregulation of innate immune signaling pathways. And so um, because of that, um, there's ample reason to study it. And because of that, we have a lot of information on them. And some of you may have seen these kinds of slides of of collating all of this information about immune signaling pathways. Here, for example, by Kitano and co-workers back in 2004, these are it's just surveying the literature and identifying uh, the receptors up here, lots of signaling proteins and the connections between them, the nuclear membrane and transcription factors. And so um, this, is, um, this is maybe the kind of slide that really, uh, really uh, discourages anybody to enter the field, <laughs> not only because apparently so much is known, but because really you don't understand what is going on. And what's of course missing on this map entirely is any kind of quantitative information and, uh, of expression levels, of interactions, of timescales. And so, you know, the idea that of how immune signaling really works and where the specificity comes from, it remains unknown um, or remains, uh, remains to be discovered. Um, and a key component is that immune signaling is dynamic. So when I, as a postdoc, measured a transcription factor activity in response to a particular stimulus, its activation can be measured in a few minutes. And then it, is, it shows dynamic control. It shows a decrease of post-induction repression. And then that is followed again by an activation. So there's an oscillatory component to this activity. And indeed, it can be seen also in these kinds of single cell experiments of microscopy videos that was done by um, Nelson et al. A, a year or two later. So if it's dynamic, then um, you know showing static pictures is not um, sufficient. And that's ultimately what uh, led me to uh, collaborate first with Andrei Levchenko and then uh, work on in my own laboratory to try to model the pathway. And uh, the tools that we use uh, are ordinary, di ordinary differential equations 
of mass action, occasionally uh, hill kinetics, but usually mass action, um, that, um, that describes simply the gain minus the loss of every one of these species. The, uh, a key, com so this is one part of this big map earlier in which a kinase is activated by a whole bunch of different stimuli up here that we don't enumerate here. The kinase is able to bind an inhibitor and, that, and lead to its decay, its de degradation. That inhibitor binds the transcription factor NFKB. So maybe I should start with this. NFKB in the nucleus can bind target genes. The inhibitor can bind that NFKB and inhibit it and take it back to the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, the inhibited transcription factor complex can associate with the kinase. Uh, and the kinase, when active, will lead to the deg degradation of the inhibitor, freeing this transcription factor to go into the nucleus, to be free and be able to go to the nucleus. When in the nucleus, it controls target, target genes, including the expression of its own inhibitors. And at the time of the slide, three of them were known. Since then, we discovered the fourth one. Uh, and they provide negative feedback. Their, in, their expression is induced, provide negative feedback. And so um, they are in, so in some sense, this, these reactions here are actually in triplicate because there are three inhibitors. <laughs> Um, that are not all shown here. So uh, this is a this is a complicated pathway, um, and um, uh, but the math here is 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 easy. Uh, what's difficult is to know about the parameters. Um, what's what's difficult is to know about the parameters. So um, um, so uh, we did a little bit of um, work on analyzing this. The, the, the pathway based on uh, using more rigorous analytical approaches. One was recently done by my postdoc, Simon Mitchell. And that's a paper that came out a couple of years ago um, in which we reduced this complex model into what we found over the years to be three key reactions. And the key reactions are that uh, that NF-kappa B can be, can associate with I-kappa B with a certain uh, uh, interaction constant. And that that I-kappa B uh, it can be degraded by a kinase. And that the NF-kappa B produces the inhibitor with a certain translation rate and or production rate and that also the inhibitor can be de degraded prior to its ability to associate with the, with, with the transcription factor. So that's this proteolysis term. And so these three reactions are modulated in different cellular contexts. And so Simon developed a simplified model of NF-kappa B uh, to address steady state control of nf cover b as a function of these three reactions that are mod modulated by different stimuli. And, um, and uh, in this steady state, he developed a simple formula um, that describes the abundance of active nf cover b as a function of the kinase as a function of the proteolysis term, and as a function of this synthesis rate, the translation rate. And uh, the derivation, I, I, I don't think I will go into here. Um, and, and importantly, that only describes the steady state. Now, the reason why we were interested in this is because uh, in this study, we found that there's crosstalk of NF-kappa B signaling by interferons. And as you I'm sure you appreciate, the interferons come in different families. And two prominent ones are type one interferons and type two interferons, or two, uh, interferon gamma. And we show here that 
both of these interferons can uh, can act can um, uh, exaggerate, enhance NF kappa B activity, but they use different mechanisms. Whereas type one interferon tends to inhibit the translation rate of I kappa B, and therefore leads to more NF kappa B in the nucleus. Uh, type two interferon leads to a decay, a enhanced degradation of this free form of IQA B before it has a chance to interact with NFKB B or the excess of IQA B. And what you can, I think what you appreciate from this is that this enhancement by type one and type two interferons uh, is, will only have an effect on NFKB B activity when in fact the kinase is active. If IKK is zero, then this decay rate is zero, which means that no NF cover B is free to begin with. But when there is an incoming stimulus, any kind of incoming stimulus, and IKK is non-zero, then these two interferons can enhance the activation of, or potentiate the activation of NF cover B by, by the kinase IKK. Um, so that was uh, an insight about um, a, um, a steady state uh, control of the pathway. But as I showed, the pathway is actually not in a true steady, not really in a steady state because it's often oscillatory or, uh, or shows complex dynamics. And actually, previously, um, we worked with Lev Zimring um, at UCSD and his students and we attempted to describe how the oscillations are themselves controlled. So we developed a different reduced model and, you know, um, from the complex, more biophysical model in which um, here again is I could be NF could be complex. Oops. There's a, I could be NF could be complex can be can it can be attacked by IKK by degrading I could be freeing NF could be to go into the nucleus, and IKK will also lead to the degradation of I could be alpha here, and that simple and there's negative feedback here, and um, and that simple model leads to an oscillatory response when IKK is suddenly activated. And what we asked is whether the period of these oscillations is somehow a function of IKK. IKK is where the stimulus attacks. And so we want to know whether the stimulus could control the period of the oscillations or whether the period of the oscillations is just an intrinsic property of the pathway and the stimulus does not really control the period. And in this analytical treatment, uh, Lev and his students showed that uh, that as a fun here plotting as a function of kinase uh, activity, the period is not a function of the uh, uh, of the kinase activity. It, it kinase the period is always about 80, 85 minutes and it's not a function of the kinase activity, but the delay in this production term of I B alpha is what determines the period. And uh, with, if the delay is too short, there will, even, there will be no oscillations and the delay will determine the period of the oscillations. And the delay is an intrinsic property of the negative feedback. It's governed by the length of the polypeptide, how long it takes to translate, how long it takes to make the mRNA polymer, how long it takes to export it, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that revealed that the oscillations that many of us are excited about in this pathway are in fact an intrinsic property are not stimulus dependent. And, uh, and here, this is, the, this is the degree to which the rate of damping of the oscillations, again, not very much a function of the kinase, but a function of the delay. So um, those, were, those were nice insights and because they, they um, and they were, should certainly have been 
shown experimentally more recently to be true. Um, but going back to the big model, the core work in my group was to actually try to put parameters to this, to all of these rate constants, uh, values to these parameters. And I was fortunate to work with many of my UCSD colleagues uh, over about 10 years, really, um, and who had, who were working on aspects of structure and kinetics and um, in, in variety of different ways. And, and so we have a, and so we determined many of these uh, rate constants either directly or were able to infer them from, from uh, biophysical experiments. And so, uh, so we using this, uh, using these uh, biophysically determined rate constants, we could construct a model that is the prerequisite for what Lee Hood described in 2001, a new approach to decoding life, systems biology. So, um, and what he describes in this review paper is this approach of parallel modeling and experimentation to elucidate life. So a modeling approach that allows you to simulate a variety of different perturbations, figure out which perturbation provides you with the most information, then do the experiment, determine the goodness of fit. And when the goodness of fit is good, then of course we're all happy and we could go home and we can maybe retire. But in the goodness, when there is a lack of, when the goodness of fit is no good, then we have a project and we can go and try to refine our model because then the lack of the goodness of fit not being good in these types of models means that there is some regulatory mechanism that exists in nature that we do not know about. We've, ad we've identified a knowledge gap. So in this systems biology approach, modeling is used as a sufficiency test of, to check our current knowledge. And we did this for NF kappa B. We made them, we have a model. We can simulate in different conditions. We can do then experiments in different cell types. We can generate data and we can determine the goodness of fit. And uh, we can do this in different, again, in different conditions. And um, therefore advance uh, the model into different versions that are more and more true or more and more capable of recapitulating experimental observations. And with each model refinement, we've got a new, we've identified a new mechanism. And when we've identified a new mechanism, we can publish. And so this was a nice hamster wheel of advancing our understanding of NFKB signaling. And so we could add essentially dynamics to the static map. And these, uh, this little animation here is model simulation based on biophysical parameters where the different species are simply indicated here and in, there are concentrations in different sizes. Um, but so uh, what have we found in this uh, with this um, or so in this approach, um, most of this work as I indicated is not really analytical, it's not mathematical, it's simulation-based, and we're treating the model as a virtual experimental system. And we are asking always, is the virtual experimental system giving us some insight that we can then um, uh, identify, that we can then uh, check experimentally? So here's a, an early study of that kind uh, with this model. We are asking, well, the kinase is, is controlled by many different types of stimuli. And so the kinase will have different types of activities because the stimuli that are converged on that kinase will activate the kinase with different dynamics. <clears throat> and so we don't know what those activities are. We can't measure them, but let's, we can only measure a few. It's very arduous to do so, but in general, they take that type of shape. There's an activation phase. There's a initial plateau that lasts a certain time B. 
And there is a deactivation phase that takes a certain amount of time. And there's probably a long-term activity that might be zero or it might be non-zero. And so if that is the general shape, we can put, we can allow, we can generate a library that has that general shape. And here's some uh, by, by giving A, B, C, and X and Y different values. And here's a few, a couple of examples of that library. You know, you can make very different IKK curves that are inputs and then use those inputs to simulate NF kappa B. And these are the outputs. So when that is done, um, here's my, the big library of inputs, uh, not so big really, it's maybe 700 or so, or I can't remember exactly. It's been a while, 2005 here. And, um, and using those inputs, um, these are the outputs. The, and of course, each input output is paired. And so what we can add, we, we can characterize the signal processing characteristics of this signaling pathway by comparing inputs and outputs. One simple way to analyze this is to break these outputs apart by uh, clustering, K means clustering, for example. And these are all similar outputs. These are all similar outputs, similar outputs. And then we're asking what are the corresponding inputs? And the inputs, very quickly you see that the inputs are actually quite different. They, they differ in the magnitude of, uh, of the IKK curve. Where, whereas here is a counterexample. These, these outputs are different in different clusters, and yet the inputs look very similar. The magnitude at the late phase is very, is very similar, but sufficiently different to drive a very different late phase activity. So let, that led to an insight that the early kinase activity is not as important not in control it you control the late kinase activity it's not as important in determining the precise nfkv response as determining the late phase ikk activity the late phase ikk activity may therefore be subject to feedback loops and so that the kinase activity is subject to feedback loops and indeed we found both negative and positive acting feedback loops that control the late IKK activity because there's a delay in the synthesis of these proteins. And, uh, and that uh, d determines um, uh, the signal processing that these, that the, to get precise late activity of the kinase. So that's the type of approach and, um, that we took. And, and so using a similar, these types of approaches of understanding signal processing, we also addressed what each of the regulators are doing. Particularly, there are four negative feedback loops and are they all doing the same thing or are they doing different things? Uh, do they have essentially um, uh, fail safe functions where one can compensate for the other or are they doing specific things? Well, the answer is they're doing very specific things because they have very different kinetic behaviors. Uh, and so first negative feedback is this IKVA B alpha. And it's really its uh, inducibility or abbreviated here is the second order derivative that determines, and I showed that already, the period of oscillations. And so this is the ne first negative feedback loop that runs very proximal. It's the second negative feedback loop that is delayed in its synthesis further and actually can counteract the oscillations in certain conditions such that you get more damping. And, um, and that's I could be epsilon. There's a third negative feedback loop that, it, that, is, that, I, that reaches further upstream. And unlike these two, these two are stoichiometric inhibitors of the transcription factor. This is an enzymatic inhibitor of some signaling process up here. And therefore, it doesn't. It functions more like an integral negative feedback, which also provides a degree of memory. So, in some sense, it's more like a potentiometer dimmer switch of the pathway 
that provides, that controls the responses to subsequent exposure, uh, which can be set by other pathways too. So, um, <clears throat> and all of these genes are highly inducible, um, but they do very different things. And, uh, and, and the fourth negative feedback loop that is quite distinct is another IQA B, but in this case, this is a big oligomeric complex that takes a long time to actually mature into a protein complex that can inhibit, and therefore it, it functions more on a time scales of 8 and 12, 12 and 24 hours, uh, and therefore uh, does not really affect this transient signaling at all, but only very long-term signaling. So, um, so these are the kinds of um, insights we had, which led to that the dynamic control of NFKB is really important. It's uh, important uh, for conveying different signals to the nucleus, and therefore is, there is some kind of dynamic or temporal code in which different NFKB dynamical features control different genes that activate different cellular responses. And uh, depending on the stimulus and the receptor, the kinase activity is amplitude modulated and the NFKB activity is uh, uh, dynamically modulated and, and, con and control different genes. So that was a hypothesis that was very attractive and a lot pointed towards it, but there were two problems with this hypothesis. And so I'm gonna go into more recent work now one is that when, when uh, our colleagues looked at single cells, they discovered an incredible amount of heterogeneity. Here, some cells first all are activated, and then very soon you can see some cells, NFKB is not in the nucleus, and, and some it is. So if it's so heterogeneous, then this, this you can't imagine that this being really a code that can convey information in any sort of uh, reliable manner. And the other thing is that in certain experiments using cell lines that are convenient experimentally, uh, the period, for example, here was always the same and, uh, and the stimulus specific dynamics, they failed to observe any kind of stimulus specific dynamics. And so um, I was sad to see some of this, uh, some of this be, you know, some of this uh, undercut our hypothesis of a temporal code. And so I decided that we should maybe jump into the fray and start doing some more work. So first of all, we felt that the previous studies were limited because cell lines were used rather than primary immune cells. And cell lines, you know, are optimized to grow in culture. And sometimes to grow in culture, you have to put your blinders on and shut down your receptors and not respond. Uh, and, um, and the other part is there just wasn't enough high quality data and it's hard to get to quantify these imaging data sets. And so we needed to develop an image analysis. So to address this, Brooks Taylor some time ago, <clears throat> uh, developed a mouse that, in which nf -kappa b is tagged with a fluorescent protein. And that protein, uh, therefore, uh, can be seen in cells. And you can see how in these very cells it's responding and it goes into the nucleus. And he developed an automatic image analysis pipeline to then watch these movies and obtain NFKB, uh, trans uh, NFKB data for many, many cells. And this is actually published in Immunity last year. Um, and here's an example uh, of that. You see some cells, they're moving around. And more and most importantly, they're being stimulated with cytokine TNF. And if you look closely, you see that NFKB is in the nucleus now and it's up, not in the nucleus and it's in the nucleus again and so forth. So it's highly oscillatory as we expect. Two cells show both oscillations, but they are not synchronous. Uh, they, there's some variability there. And here are, this, these, this culture here is stimulated with LPS, a different stimulus, endotoxin from bacteria. And you see that NFKB is much more steady 
in its activation, it stays in the nucleus, is not oscillatory. So that was exciting. And so uh, this image analysis is revealing some interesting things. And so not just two cells, but we need hundreds and thousands of cells. And here is a heat map now. Where every row is a cell. And we see oscillatory activities. And you see that after the second wave, you really don't see any synchronicity anymore. But really, every cell is still oscillating. Almost every cell is oscillating. Whereas in response to LPS, the, there is less clear that there's oscillation. Some of them might oscillate later on, but early on is a very steady activity. And of course, if you do average measurements like these, you don't see the oscillations very well in this because they're asynchronous. So, uh, so averaging is not a good way to capture the complexity of the data. And uh, so rather these heat maps. And so we generated data for a stimulus at many different concentrations, a different stimulus, and a few more and a few more. So lots of data. <clears throat> and so, so the question is, when we have so much information here and we see differences, but we really want to know what features in this data are stimulus specific. What matters? Uh, and the approach we took was to think about a, a library, if you will, or a, a panel of features. For example, a feature might be the amplitude of a certain time point. That's what we measure. But it could also be the integrated activity at that time point. Or it could be the derivative of it at that time point. Or it could be um the duration the duration over a certain threshold different thresholds different durations for each trajectory or the first peak amplitude or second peak amplitude and so we just developed as many for the Fourier transform or you know and and so we developed 918 features here and asked which ones of these features <clears throat> might actually be um informative about the stimulus or which feature yeah what are the features that are stimulus specific what are the features that are informative about the stimulus and so that's an information maximizing algorithm using shannon's information uh, 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 theory and where nfkb is the chat is in this channel conveying information from the transmitter to the receiver in the in the nucleus and so we asked how what are the features which one of the 918 maximizes my information and and so uh the first feature will maximize information is about one bit um or and then if we add a second feature or we find the top two features which is not necessarily the first but the top two um is a bit more and the top three features we, which does not necessarily include the first two or first is more and you see this curve sort of plateau out at around seven features at around 2.1 bits and of course the number of bits here really is an underestimate estimate of the reality because we have technical difficulties in measuring the data the, the measuring the responses reliably but so I'm not paying much too much attention about the actual value of the bits, but more uh, how many features do we need to describe the information? And there's about seven, and they they uh, describe uh, certain um, aspects of these curves in a way. So there's two early derivatives that, in some sense, describe really the speed with which the response goes up. And then there's a th and then there is the peak amplitude that also matters. And then there's another derivative that tells me whether if it's negative, then this is a strong post-induction repression. So it's, more, it's likely an oscillatory response. Um, and if not, if it's not negative, then it may be more longer lasting. And, uh, and then there's other features that on a longer time scale, 16 hours here, like a, just the total activity, or 
or the time to half maximal activity, so early versus late activity, or the total duration over a low threshold. So these are, these are informative features that are informative about the stimulus, the dose and the ligand. And because they're informative, there are, uh, can be, there are packets of information that convey uh, that, that are part of this code. And so the, the journal editor really liked this idea of a signaling codon, just an, an, an analogy to the genetic codon that transmits information from one generation to the next. This is a packet of information that is transmitted from the extracellular space where signals are detected to the nucleus in the to the target genes in the nucleus. And so those signaling codons are deployed stimulus specifically because that's we, we selected them for that. Speed is low with CPG and poly IC. Peak amplitude is very similar here because we're only looking at the top, the, the highest dose, but for lower doses, peak amplitude is really important. Oscillatory, very high with TNF, but not so high with this. Total activity and duration. And so you can see the specificity and you see there's a, that different cells have different levels. And here we're just showing the median in this violin plot, this distribution for the hundreds or thousands of cells we've looked at. Um, but, um, but you can see that each one is distinct. And so if these are codons that uh, code words of a, of, of a signaling code, then we ought to be able to teach them to a machine and tell the machine what the stimulus was. So using a classification algorithm called ensemble of decision trees, uh, we can either use ni the 918 features or we can just use the six. And we find that the six do just as well in this precision score of this classifier as, um, as the 918, as all of them that we started with. So that um, confirms that the six capture all the information that is needed to identify a ligand um, as well as one can, which isn't perfect. You know, the precision is not, is 75% or 80% so forth. And in fact, you can see this here in those confusion matrix, how well each ligand is identified, 70%. But you can also see where there's confusion. So for example, when a true ligand is pan through CSK, 25% of the time, the nucleus might think it's actually LPS. And, um, and so, the good news is that both LPS and Panther CSK are derived from bacteria. They, bac they indicate bacteria. They don't indicate virus. They don't in indicate cytokine. They indicate bacteria. So, um, so we can collapse some of these different ligands into three classes. Cytokines that come from the host, some ligands that come from bacteria, and some ligands that come from viruses. And then our position is, is higher. So. Uh, <clears throat> So then we asked, is, does this matter? Well, there's diseases associated with inflammatory signaling, and here's one. And um, Sjogren's syndrome flares up um, sporadically. There's a mouse model for it. We bred the reporter into the mice. We can generate this kind of data. And then we apply uh, our machine learning algorithm, or we first look at the, the codons to be decompose or uh, dimensionality reduce, if you will, this these um, these heat maps, these these trajectories into the six codons, and we see that different stimuli deploy the codons differently. And in in this mouse model for disease, some of them look exactly the same, and some of them are very perturbed. This looks the same. This is perturbed. This looks the same. So, so uh, very specific features are affected by this 
by this particular disease model. And that affects the precision with which the nucleus knows about what goes on on the outside, whereas this is the precision for, uh, for a healthy macrophage, a surgeon's macrophage shows a lot of confusion when the true ligand is TNF, it's very often misinterpreted to be endotoxin bacterial. So um, that, um, uh, so therefore we could think that maybe these diseases might be called confusion diseases. So let me break briefly before I go into some more math modeling. Um, Sorry, but we're going to be have a hard stop at four o'clock. Ah, I've yeah. taken a long time already. Sorry about that. So then we will, I will stop right here. Question or... I didn't want to interrupt you because it was so fascinating, but I <laughs> normally have. To yeah, I that. have a, I didn't really, I must have overestimated my. Uh, anyway, I, maybe I should uh, acknowledge some of the people. I, there is some nice math still about some Hopfbifurcation, but I think we don't need that. And, uh, and no longer sharing. No longer sharing, right. Um, but I, let me just go to my acknowledgement slide, um, which is right here. And um, uh, Brooks Taylor is the one who initiated this last project and uh, Ade Adelaya brought it to fruition, MD-PhD student who moved on and Apexha Singh is continuing and, and Shalu also. And um, Roy Woolman, Meg Deeds are my colleagues here at UCLA who I really value their advice on many things. So thanks very much. Okay, well, we have time for a couple of questions. Oh, I see Carlos. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Since you picked on me, I'll, I'll ask a question. So I was curious about, the, you, you were talking a lot about the, the optimization process and the parameter estimation and uh, how you guys went through, you know, the, the optimization, the, the parameter estimation. Um, can you tell me a bit more about the process? You, you guys were determining, you know, kind of vectors of parameters, but, you know, of course there's the Bayesian approach. I'm curious whether you think that there might be more space there, uh, um, you know, to do something. Yeah, I think, so what I didn't show you is that we now that we have all the single cell data, right? All the work prior to 2018 essentially was using population level measurements. And clearly the it's very clear that the population level measurements do not capture the dynamics that you see in single cells. And so uh, it's now really important to have a model that is fit to the single cell data sets. And we have done that in a sort of eyeballing manner, and that's in that same paper. But what hasn't been done is to fit the model to actually the single cell data, and therefore the, actually the capture the heterogeneity of these data sets, right? So where these parameters are distributed, and maybe there's stochastic some components, some reactions are indeed stochastic. I mean, that is something that is ongoing. Um, and I could show you early successes, but it's by no means done. And there's definitely room to do more. And I'd love for anybody who's interested in that to, you know, we'd be happy to provide the data sets and, um, and go to town. <laughs> it's not an easy problem. We should talk more then, but... Um... Well, no, and then the reason is that I've seen this now so many so many different data sets. John Albeck has seen this where the cells themselves do so many different things, and, and the population, how does to connect? It's very very challenging. So you know, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Veronica, did you you have a question? I was yeah, going to I, say, I Reinhardt. Before we do that, Reinhardt and I both have to leave at four. However. If there are plenty of questions, uh, Lorenzo has agreed to, to stay in and, and host the meeting for as long as you need. So, so you don't have to rush so much. Well, it was a pleasure. Thanks. Oh, no, please, uh, Veronica, go ahead. Yeah. 
So great. So, talk. so you're we're on we're yeah. you're okay. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I, I have, I guess, a uh, few questions. So you, you showed that the response, responses are very dynamic, heterogeneous, and complicated. So, but do the responses uh, synchronize uh, with stronger stimulus? I, I'm more interested in heterogeneity. So, and also um, how the variance, for example, in transcriptional factor activity change through the response. Uh, for example, if you look at deactivation phase, uh, will the variance kind of shrink or will it increase? Because I can see many different scenarios. For example, if, if the response is synchronizes, then it might actually increase or it might decrease. It, mm -hmm. uh, the cells probably at the beginning, at the baseline, they are probably also uh, kind of desynchronized. So, so what happened to the variance, my question, and yeah. through yeah. the response? You mean the variance? Uh, in NFKB signaling versus the target gene expression? Great question. Um, and we are beginning to have uh, single cell RNA seq data also on that. Um, you know, one concern, of course, is that the technical noise of each of these approaches is the, the contribution of technical noise in measuring or measurement noise is different, you know? And so it's a little bit difficult to, at this point, to say with certainty uh, whether there is, how noise is transmitted to gene expression. A priori, I would have thought that gene expression adds more noise, <laughs> uh, you know, because you've got, it's a single molecule event and um, mass action kinetics can't really, you know, are more likely to break down. Um, and uh, but but um, but the, but some specificity certainly remains in the gene expression. But it's a great question, but we haven't addressed it yet. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so at the population, yes. so I should say we have gene regulatory models that take these NFKB activation uh, and are able to reproduce. Uh, are able to reproduce the bulk measurements of the of RNA to some extent, and those same models can then be uh, tested for single cell data, and that is also ongoing work that um, uh, is is difficult actually. <laughs> but what would be your prediction then? Not not measurement, but prediction because you you know the system, you kind of feel the system. My prediction. Uh, would be that we that some some aspects of the heterogeneity is collapsed as you would indi indicate that there's actually a convergence and then other but then there's additional uh, layers of noise that are contributed to um, are added um, you know so one difficulty with the single cell RNA measurements is that they're all destructive and you therefore you can't get trajectory data directly. So then to infer the trajectory to the trajectories from multiple single time points, you know, is something that um, uh, is not, is, it requires certain assumptions. And so you have to be careful what you do there. Other questions? If not, then... Well, I had one, actually. Oh, uh, great. One. Uh, I'm sorry I, I, I missed some, if I missed some bit. Uh, I'm very interested about the oscillation part. So yeah. essentially, you say that uh, the oscillation is dependent on the delay. So we have some delay that in, in some cellular process, and these might generate oscillatory pathway, if you can elaborate a little bit on this. This is very interesting topic for me, but yeah, it, yeah, it's it's great. So um, yes, there is a delay, um, and that's actually from a modeling perspective something that um, we often struggle with because some software or you know numerical solvers don't really allow for that so straightforwardly. What's important for the delays is that they're mediated. Yeah, much of the delays are due to the the generation of the messenger RNA 
or the polypeptide. And both of them are polymers, right? You have to add one amino acid to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And only when all of it is done, then the thing is active, right? So if 99% of the translation is completed, you have, still have zero activity, right? It's a very abrupt delay, right? And so capturing these delays with a cascade, which was often what we do in modeling, right? Uh, is sometimes not great. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't show the kind of very clear cut behavior and the delay is indeed what is important for, uh, for these oscillations. Um, and depending on how long the delay is, that means how long the polypeptide is, how long the mRNA is, that determines how robust an oscillator you have. If the delay is too long, then it also won't, you know, and, it, and if then something else has to be different, but there is a, there is, there is an optimum, right? And, um, and for, in this system, we, because we have different negative feedback regulators, some of them produce, they all provide negative feedback, and some of them produce oscillations and others don't. And that is due to the, the precise delay in these production terms. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anyway, thank you both for questions and thanks, Lorenzo, for organizing it. Yeah, it was a really amazing talk and thank you for uh, for coming and you're welcome to come back another time since uh, I say that we have a, you have a lot of material and everything was very fascinating and uh, nothing I see that talk. And, I'm just uh, agreeing that was absolutely fascinating okay. <laughs> thanks thank you for yeah thank that it's can, can I sneak in one question, Lorenzo, before you shut us down? Definitely, definitely. Until they shut me down, I'm okay. So <laughs> I think it's 4.30, they are deadline anyway. Um, and if I missed this, I apologize. Um, what are the cells you're working with? And is this going to be universal in your cell population? I'm guessing these are macrophages. Correct. Yeah, I'm sorry, I wasn't too explicit. Yeah, the, the last work with all the single cell work we did in macrophages because, you know, they really are very good at detecting pathogens. And so we decided to work with those. Uh, and they are also cells that are attached. And so we can image them. Whereas cells that are floating around are much harder to keep track of. They're the pits. <laughs> so, uh, but we are trying those things too with cells that are floating. Um, so we'll see. Uh, yeah. So and the, I was going to say, and then kind of a follow up question, just in case your computers aren't working hard enough dealing with all this data. Is there any, I don't even know how quite to word it, any sort of near neighbor effects? Ah, great. No, great question. Um, uh, there is actually, <laughs> there is, there is. Cool. There is, so there is, so uh, in some conditions, because some of these, you know, some of these pathogen derived stimuli allow the cell, lead, you know, uh, lead the cells to produce cytokine. And that cytokine is then, um, is then uh, observed, you know, is then sensed by the neighbors. And so the neighbors therefore see a combination of the primary stimulus and, um, and the secondary stimulus. Yeah. And given the heterogeneity, particularly at low concentrations of primary stimulus, uh, we see some neighbor, some neighbor effects. So, and so that's a really, you know, that I didn't go into that, but when we're attempting to model, to fit a model to our data, we are hoping, we are generating data where we inhibit that secondary cytokine. So we, you know, our, 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 our data is a little cleaner, um, <laughs> but it's, a, it's complicated stuff. Oh um, my gosh. In case it wasn't hard enough, now you've got all the cells interacting with each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> the nice thing is that we have a time zero, right? And so um, we we kind of, you know, we were starting we're starting with a particular starting point, and so 
if we we can ask the model only to capture the first hour, only first to capture the three hours. You know, and the longer we go, the more indirect pathways will play a role. So we can kind of time scale, um, you know, uh, 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 separate things a little bit uh, in in in, the, in our modeling. Well, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for the questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so if there are no other question, and I see that many people have dropped off. There is time for a last question if there are any. Um, otherwise, I will call uh, the, the meeting to an end and uh, I hope to see you again next week. Thank you all Great. for coming and thank you, Alex, for a very nice talk and you're welcome to come back again. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'll welcome. I look forward to coming back and listening to somebody else. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye. Or a good day. <laughs>